Well, welcome to this Ascension Day reflection from St. Mary and St. Eanswith in Folkestone. Let us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that as we believe your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to have ascended into the heavens, so we in heart and mind may also ascend, and with him continually dwell, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and for ever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Jesus led the disciples out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. And a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 1. As the disciples were watching, Jesus was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing into heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now there is a, a particularly uh, literal interpretation of this passage which um, envisages Jesus rising like a rocket up into the sky and, um, and being consumed um, by the clouds, enveloped in the clouds. Uh, and the last thing you see is his feet. And um, this um, particularly literal interpretation of the passage is, de is depicted in these medieval paintings. And it's also echoed in the Chapel of Ascension at Walsingham uh, by this uh, sculpture, this installation. Now, in the ancient and medieval world, um, their, their worldview um, combined the material and the spiritual realm so that they interacted with one another. Uh, nevertheless, the spiritual realm was considered to be above, to be up. And that's how they considered it. Their, often their cosmology was not really separated out from their theology. Everything, all of their knowledge was all of a piece. And they considered that because God was far superior to them and beyond and, and utterly um, beyond their understanding and apprehension, uh, they therefore considered that God was in fact up and above. And this was reflected not only in their cosmology but in their understanding of the heavens. Um, and this, this, this understanding came down right until kind of the, the advent of modern science when we began to understand what the universe was physically, materially, really, really like. Our modern scientific knowledge, therefore, is a real problem for us if we focus on the literal interpretation of the words of the Gospels. We know, don't we, um, that if you go up, you don't get to heaven. You'll pass by the moon and you'll pass through the solar system and you'll pass through any number of galaxies and you will go on for infinity. The universe is much more wondrous, in fact, and much more vast than the ancients could ever have imagined, and, and heaven is not up there. So, knowing this, what are we to make of the ascension story? Well, first, 
let's remember the limitations of, of language, which reflects the everyday concepts of our time and culture and understanding. People uh, sometimes say to me, I've seen a vision. And as we talk, it emerges that nothing was actually seen. And uh, actually, it wasn't really a vision. They didn't visualize anything. But they weren't lying. They were struggling to describe a profound spiritual experience that their everyday language had no terms for. They did the best they could. And perhaps the biblical authors too had this experience. They had profound spiritual experiences that their everyday language had no terms for. They be did the best they could with the cultural understanding that they had inherited. So let's remember that this that we are considering, that we've read about, this was for them a profound spiritual experience. After all, it resulted in them kneeling and worshipping and obeying Jesus' command to go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. And because this is a profound spiritual experience for them, perhaps that's why poetry can sometimes unfold truths that mere description can't. Here is a sonnet for Ascension Day by Malcolm Geith. We saw his light break through the cloud of glory, whilst we were rooted still in time and place, as earth became a part of heaven's story and heaven opened to his human face. We saw him go, and yet we were not parted. He took us with him to the heart of things, the heart that broke for all the brokenhearted is whole and heaven-centred now and sings. Sings in the strength that rises out of weakness. Sings through the clouds that veil him from our sight. Whilst we ourselves became his cloud of witness and sing the waning darkness into light. His light in us and ours in him concealed which all creation waits to see revealed. Geitz mentions the, the clouds that veil him from our sight. That's an important detail in our Acts passage, because clouds have a significance in the Bible way beyond mere meteorology. Let's not forget that the books of the Bible are primarily Theological. They're, they're meant to teach us something about God and our response to him. So what is the significance of clouds here? Well, I'm deeply indebted to Dom Eric Varden, the abbot of Mount St. Bernard Abbey in Leicestershire, for opening this up for me. This is what he writes. In the Bible, a cloud is not just something to do with the weather, when Israel walked out of Egypt, the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud. Exodus 13.21 The cloud was a sign that God was in their midst. When Moses scaled Sinai to stand before God, the Lord descended in a cloud. It was likewise in a cloud that later he filled the tent of meeting with his presence. By the book of Numbers, the cloud has become an established symbol of God's nearness. And this connection is further developed in the historical books. What happens when the temple in Jerusalem is finished, the building work all done? What makes a mere monument into a sanctuary? Well, at the moment of dedication, 2 Chronicles 5, 13 to 14 says, A cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. The cloud is glory. The glory is presence. 
it tells us that the Lord, the Father of all, is there. I read in this light, the Ascension story is not only less perplexing, it is very much more attractive and mysterious. The conclusion of Christ's earthly ministry turns out to be continuous with the long history of divine self-revelation. It is a moment of epiphany. In terms of Christ's career, the ascension cloud recalls the cloud that covered the Mount of Transfiguration, from which the Father's voice announced, This is my Son, the Beloved, in Luke 9, verse 35. It points forward, too, to the Lord's definitive coming at the end of history. Luke gives us the very words of Jesus, Speaking of trials to come, he assures his disciple that they will see, they will see from, this is in Luke 21, 27, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. On that day, the cloud will announce the completion of time. The message of the ascension then is not that Christ vanishes beyond earth's orbit, but that he enters the Father's glory. So that's from Dom Eric Vardon. Now, this understanding, does this mean that Jesus is beyond us mere mortals now, now that he is in heaven with God? Uh, this is the sense I get from images like this, painted around 1410 by Monaco Lorenzo. I also get the sense of the separatedness of Christ from this poem by Denise Levitoff called Ascension. Stretching himself as if again through downpress of dust upward soul giving way to the thread of white that reaches for daylight to open as green leaf that it is. Can ascension not have been arduous, almost, as the return from shale? And back through the tomb into breath, matter reanimate now must relinquish itself, its human cells, molecules, five senses, linear vision endured as man. The soul, all-encompassing gaze, resumed now, eye of eternity. Relinquished earth's broken Eden, expulsion, liberation, last self-enjoined task of incarnation. He again fathering himself, seed case splitting, he again mothering his birth, torture and bliss. For John Donne, however, Jesus is, is not separating himself from creation, shedding his, his human nature, um, getting back to something um, more comfortable um, to the, the super being that he, he really is. No, for John Donne, Jesus is battering down the gates of heaven to grant us access. Salute the last and everlasting day joy at the uprising of this son and son, yet whose just tears or tribulation have purely washed or burnt your drossy clay. Behold the highest, parting hence away, lightens the dark clouds which he treads upon. Nor doth he by ascending show alone, but first he and he first enters the way. O strong ram, which has battered heaven for me, mild lamb, which with thy blood has marked the path, bright torch, which shinest, that I the way may see, O with thy own blood quench thy own just wrath. And if the Holy Spirit my muse did raise, deign at my hands this crown of prayer and praise. 
And this is a profound truth, as relevant today as it ever was, that there is a human being in heaven and that he has opened the access to God for us forever. And yet, the poem Ascension Day by Seamus Sweeney touches another dimension of the Ascension, I think. Ascension Day. A helpful article explains that it was not up, up, like Apollo, but in a cloud of unknowing. It marks high summer, long days at this latitude. Any explanation somehow strains considering what it has to follow, the resurrection, when humanity embarks on a new course. Our attitude, believe what we will, no longer remains what it was. Even doubt is no longer hollow, but encloses a specific moment that sparks through time since, a reason for gratitude. Back to the ascension, lifted out of the human round, a culmination. If the story was just about one time, one place, one nation, it was not so. There is an after. Still to come, Acts, the illumination of Pentecost, plenty of exalt, exalted disaster. Plenty of human error, the fall of soul, the realisation we can have but one master, hard earned as this knowledge is for us all. Ascension is a beginning like all ends. In that cloud there is the call to follow our path wherever it sends. Now here is a sense that the cloud which hides God from our sight is just a breath away and easily parted so that the spiritual realm infuses the material world, which is the only reality that our contemporary so-called scientific culture is prepared to admit. No, here the mystery of God's presence wraps around every moment of our life and he can unshroud himself in a moment any moment and we suddenly realize that we are face to face with God and that we always have been I'm going to show you some more images now each one has what is known as a mandala it's the circle or oval that represents the cloud of the presence of God's glory to which Jesus has gone before us. In the first image, the dark mandala emphasizes the mysterious and unknowable nature of God, of his presence with us and of our spiritual journey. Here in this image, Jesus enters the sphere of God in a mandala of cloud. God's presence is often shrouded to us in the world, but can part in a moment and shine into our lives with his glory. In this image, Fiery, multi-eyed seraphim wings upon a chariot supports the great entrance to heaven. The fire and the eyes anticipate the gift of the Holy Spirit that we shall celebrate in nine days' time at the Feast of Pentecost. The presence of God makes spiritual power and the gifts and wisdom of the Holy Spirit available to us. if we are willing to gaze into heaven as the disciples did, if we are willing to worship Jesus and trust him as the disciples did. Let us pray. Risen Christ, you have raised our human nature to the throne of heaven. 
Help us to seek and serve you, that we may join you at the Father's side, where you reign with the Spirit in glory, now and forever. Amen.